a dark, scary world. We don't have to walk alone. Amen. Amen. He's here to walk with us, before us, behind us, beside us. And so thank you for that special tonight. If you got your Bibles, now let's go to Philippians chapter 4 tonight. Philippians chapter 4. And thank you for being back on a Thursday night. A good crowd. And normally at a Sunday through a Friday meeting, Thursday dips down quite a bit. There's a good crowd here tonight. So thank you for being with us tonight. And trust you'll be back tomorrow one more time. Let's have a strong finish. Try to have somebody uh, beside your side. Have a visitor. Bring in a co-worker, a neighbor, a family member. Uh, especially if you got a young person. Be sure to bring them tomorrow night. Uh, there'll be special application of the message for young people and teenagers. And so try to have somebody by your side. Appreciate your faithfulness uh, all this week. Thank you for dinner once again and all those who provided that and made that possible. Got here to set up and clean up. And so thank you for that. That's made a big difference this week. It's been a, it's been a big blessing for a lot of people to not have to worry about that, uh, but to come home from work or school and uh, get uh, together and then come straight to church and not have to worry about a meal, and that's a blessing. Uh, if it wasn't for that, some people may not come this week, and so uh, that was a big deal. Thank you for doing that again. And so we'll be in Philippians chapter 4 tonight, and I trust tonight's message will be an encouragement to you. I don't just want to preach you tonight, I want to minister to you tonight, and I really want to help you tonight. Can I do that? And uh, I believe there's some wonderful help in the Word of God that we all need. And revival, the simplest definition of revival is to return back to normal. That's what we're after this week. And Vance Hadner said, uh, we Christians live so subnormal that if we ever got back to normal, the world would think that we're abnormal. Uh, I want to get back to normal. Amen. And many of us are not living the normal Christian life. We're going to see that tonight. But I want to get back to normal. And I trust that he'll use his word uh, in our lives once again tonight. If you're a visitor, we say thank you for joining us tonight. You're an honored guest. Thank you for uh, coming to be with us. And trust you receive a blessing tonight as well. Philippians chapter 4 will be on preaching text tonight. In Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul arrived in Philippi on his second uh, missionary journey. And as was his custom when he arrived, he began to evangelize and, and begin to witness for Jesus Christ. And the first person he runs into in Acts chapter 16 uh, was a woman by the name of Lydia. And she was from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple. And the Bible says there that interaction that the Lord had opened her heart. And I believe she received the gospel. And the Bible says that uh, she and her household were baptized uh, on that day. Uh, they continue traveling through uh, Philippi. And they run into a little slave girl who's possessed by an evil spirit. And this young lady is a soothsayer. She, uh, by the power of Satan, she can predict the future. And uh, men owned her. And she made, uh, those men made a, a profit off of her soothsaying and her, her satanic gift that she had. After several days of following Paul and Silas around Philippi and harassing them, uh, Paul finally had enough of that. And he calls that evil spirit out of that young lady. And uh, when that takes place, all of a sudden there's an uproar. Uh, you just imagine when she lost her gift, uh, the men that owned her uh, lost their financial gain. You understand that? And so uh, maybe there was an uproar because of that. And by the way, whenever God begins to work in a city and people start getting saved and revival begins to break out, mark it down, the devil's going to lose some business. Amen. He's going to lose territory. We talked about that last night. And uh, finally, the men who owned her caused an uproar. And as a result, uh, Paul and Silas were arrested. Uh, they were beaten. There was many strikes put on their back. And they were locked up into the innermost part uh, of the prison, uh, the most secure part of the prison. And as they were locked up there, their black the backs were bloody, no doubt were bleeding. And at midnight, the Bible says, they were uh, singing and uh, praises and, and praying unto God. And about that time, God sent an earthquake to begin to shake uh, that prison. And all of a sudden, the prison doors flung open. And the Philippian jailer that was on duty that night I took a sword out and was going about to commit suicide. And you understand that jailers during that time, if someone uh, had a prisoner escaped on your watch, uh, that would have that cost you your life. So he said, I might as well take care of it myself. He's about to commit suicide. And Paul says, wait a second. Uh, stop. Uh, don't do that. We're all here. We're not going anywhere. And he says to Paul, what must I do uh, to be saved? You say, how do you know what salvation was? How do you know who Jesus was? Christ was because he heard Paul and Silas singing and praying there in the innermost part of the prison at midnight. Can I say tonight if you're going through a valley, if you're going through a trial, may I just remind you tonight that people are watching you, your co-workers are watching you, your kids are watching you tonight. Yep. Yeah. He said, what must I do to be saved? 
By the way, this is the question the whole world is asking tonight. What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe for the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt but be saved. May I say tonight, we don't behave our way into heaven. We believe our way into heaven. He said, believe for the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Not only did he get saved, but the Bible says that his household got saved. And there that a Philippian jailer began to wash off the wounds of Paul and Silas. And the Bible says that Paul, that Paul went on to baptize by the Philippian jailer and the rest of his family, the rest of his household. I mean, think about that tonight. The Philippian jailer got saved. If he had a wife, the wife got saved. If he had a son, the son got saved. If he had a daughter, the daughter got saved. If he had a dog, it got saved. If he had a cat, if he had a cat, if he had a cat, he died and went to hell. It was a household salvation. Anyway, she read the rest of the chapter again. And the chapter finally closes out. And there in Acts chapter 16, now that Philippian church was birthed and came into an existence. All these years later, uh, the Apostle Paul's in prison in Rome, and he writes a letter back to the Philippians. And uh, I love the way that uh, chapter 1, verse number 3 of Philippians opens up. He says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Well, when he thought about uh, those believers there in Philippi and that young church, just think of the faces that uh, flashed across his mind. Boy, he saw Lydia, didn't he? Boy, he thought about that little servant girl, didn't he? He thought about the Philippian jailer and his wife and his, his boy and his family there. Those are the people that he thought. And he says, every time I remember you, I thank God for you. And he goes on to write the letter to the Philippians. And unlike other letters, he was not writing to co confront sin. He was not writing to correct uh, some doctrinal issue. He wrote the letter for two reasons. Number one, uh, uh, multiple times these believers had, had given him financial gifts to help him in the ministry. And they had done that time and time again. And they did it another time. And so Paul's writing them to say one more time, thank you for your most recent gift uh, to me in my ministry. But there's another reason. He was uh, he was writing to encourage the, uh, some of the believers there in the church to lay aside their animosity and make peace with one another so that there would be unity in the church. Man, I say this, God wants unity in the church. Amen. He doesn't call us to uniformity, but he wants unity in the church. We don't have to be twins to be brothers. Amen. But he's calling for peace in the church. When you finally get down to chapter number four, and he's closing out the letter, he's giving his final applications, and there's two verses in chapter four that I want to spend our time together looking at tonight, and I, I, I believe this, I believe if there's any other, uh, more than any other verses in the Word of God over the past several years that I've run to, it's these two verses right here. Almost on a daily basis, maybe multiple times throughout the day, I find myself running to these two verses. And I believe these are life-changing verses, life-transforming verses. And I want to share these two with you tonight and share my heart with you tonight and minister to you if that's okay. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, be careful for nothing. In other words, Paul says, hey, don't worry about anything. Well, how many knows that's easy to preach, but it's hard to live he said, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, what's well, a sweet thing, isn't it? Yeah. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep, shall guard, shall protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Father, tonight... Revival is simply returning back to normal. And Lord, normal for the Christian is to experience on a day-to-day -day basis the peace of God in our hearts. But the reality is many of us live day-to-day -day -day as nervous wrecks. Lord, tonight we need a revival. We need a revival of the peace of God. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, I, I, I confess tonight that I am weak, but I confess that you are strong. And Lord, tonight is just a feeble uh, vessel tonight. I pray that you're, you would manifest your presence and power here tonight and use your word, Lord, to transform our hearts and lives and give us hope tonight and comfort. In Jesus' name, amen. His name was R.C. Trench. He was the Archbishop of Dublin. He lived with a morbid fear that one day he would become paralyzed. 
One night he was sitting next to a lady at a banquet, and she overheard him uh, 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 saying these, overheard him saying these uh, mournful, dreadful words over and over again. He said, "It's happened. It's happened. It's finally happened." He says, "I've lost all feeling in my right leg." She turned to him and said, Sir, it may come for you to know that it's my leg you are pinching. And uh, <laughs> how many know somebody like that that's always worried about something? Who says, I'm a person like that. I'm always worried about something. How many would agree tonight that people need to chill out? According to the Anxiety Center, 18.1% of adults in America are affected by an anxiety disorder. That's approximately 40 million people between the ages of 18 to 54. A study published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry reported that anxiety disorders cost the U.S. more than $42 billion a year. 65% of North Americans take prescription medications daily. 43% take a mood-altering prescriptions on a daily basis. How tonight would agree that people need to chill out. Now listen to me, I'm not, if you've got deep, uh, serious uh, issues and, and you struggle with that, I'm not making light of that. You understand my heart tonight, you know me well enough, and if you need some serious help, you need to seek out some professional help tonight, amen? And you get the victory in your life and you go on with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Get some help at the help that you need. But this morning, uh, this evening, I want to preach on anxiety, I want to preach on the subject of worry, and I'm talking about the nagging worry that eats at us day by day over finances and situations and our family and our kids. The the normal everyday worries that you and I struggle with, that's what I'm talking about tonight. How many times have you seen on Facebook, maybe you heard somebody say this, maybe you see a meme or a picture, a graphic on Facebook saying something like this, well, I'm just too blessed to be stressed. You ever heard that? I'm just too blessed to be stressed. But the reality is tonight, if most Christians, even the ones that are here tonight, were honest with themselves, were honest with God tonight, if they were honest with themselves, they would truly have to say... I'm too stressed to be blessed. Tonight I'm going to preach on this subject, unusual title, I understand, but I'm going to preach on this subject tonight, Chill Out. When you come to Philippians chapter 4, we find a biblical response to worry. Can I say tonight, there is a biblical response to worry. And that response is not alcohol, it's not drugs, it's not dope, it's not Netflix, it's not YouTube, come on now. It's not popping uh, Xanax, whatever, it's, whatever else you want to use uh, to drown those worries. There is a biblical and a scriptural response to worry found in the Word of God in Philippians chapter 4. I want to give you a three-point outline tonight. And in fact, each point just has one word tonight. And I pray that these three words would help you to remember the truths that are found here in these two verses tonight. If you're taking notes, jot down this word. It's the word cease. It's the word cease. In verse number 6, the Bible says, be careful for nothing. Here the Apostle Paul gives the Philippians a cease and desist order. The word careful means to be full of care. It means to be anxious. It means to be worried. In fact, you'll remember the story of Jesus and Martha. And uh, Jesus shows up to Mary and Martha's house. And uh, and Martha's just a worried wreck, isn't she? And she's stressing out. And all of Jesus says to her, she says, Martha, Martha, thou art troubled and careful about many things. He said, Martha, you're worked up. Martha, you're stirred up. Martha, you're, you're, you're pacing back and forth over the carpet. He said, Martha, you're absolutely worried and you need to stop. That's what, the, that's what Paul's telling the Philippian believers here. He's saying, stop worry. He commands them not to worry about anything. Now, whenever I read that, that all, what always strikes me uh, odd about that, what strikes me is when I consider who wrote this in the situation that he was in and the situations that he was facing. Number one, the Apostle Paul here was being detained. He was in prison. He was locked up. Uh, the second problem he was facing tonight, uh, that during that time uh, was death. He knew he was about to uh, stand before the judge. There was a, he was about to be sentenced and he knew there was a potential. He was going to lose his life. Not only was he detained, not only was he facing death, but he was also facing a division and dealing with a division within the church. In fact, chapter 4, verse number 2, notice this. Chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I beseech Judas and beseech Synthache that they be of the same mind in the Lord. These two individuals couldn't get along. You say, what were those two men fighting about? No, friend, those were two men. Those were two women. There was a cat fight in the church of Philippi. 
And the division between them two is beginning to create a division uh, in the church. Can I say this? It's sad that folks in the church can't get along. Yeah. It was sad back then, and it's sad today. Yeah. Excuse me, I've been in churches where two ladies couldn't get along. And boy, there was tension. There was no liberty. Come on now. Listen to me, and I know in a situation right now where the pastor brought uh, counselors in, some preachers that, count, that specialized in counseling, biblical counselors. He brought in specialists. They counseled and counseled and counseled, and they couldn't get along. Finally, one of them had to end up leaving the church, and when that took place, there was peace in the church again. Boy, it's sad when folks can't get along uh, in the church. So if anybody had a reason to be worried, it should have been the Apostle Paul. But here the Apostle Paul is the one writing to these believers and telling them not to worry and giving them the secret to overcome the worry and the anxiety in his life. And I believe in Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6 uh, that we find here in the Word of God two reasons, two biblical reasons for why you and I should not worry tonight. Number one, the first reason is this, because worry is destructive. Worry is destructive. And I believe that can be found in the very meaning and the definition of the word worry in this passage. The word worry, the word careful, means to strangle and it means to choke. And if you've ever lived and struggled with anxiety and worry, that's a pretty accurate definition, isn't it, tonight? I mean, think about it. It'll choke the life out of you. Worry strangles the hope out of tomorrow. Worry drains the joy out of life. Worry twists our thinking. Worry injures our outlook. Worry attacks the nerve. Nervous system. The word anxiety needs to be pulled in opposite directions. Hey, there's been times in your life and my life when faith was calling us forward, but fear latched hold of us and tried to pull us backwards, and we're caught in the middle, and it feels like worry is going to pull us in half. It is physically destructive uh, to our lives. Here's the following list of the most common side effects of worry. Feeling nervous, tense, fearful, a restlessness, panic attack, a rapid heart rate, fast breathing, hyperventilation, sweating, shaking, fatigue, weakness, a dizziness, difficulty concentrating, sleep problems, a nausea, a digestive issues, feeling too hot, feeling too cold, a chest pain. You say, what are you tonight, a doctor? No, but I brought one with me. Charles Mayo, the co-founder of the Mayo Clinic, said this. He made the observation that worry adversely affects the circulatory system, the heart, the glands, the entire nervous system. In the medical journal American Mercury, Mayo said he never knew anyone who died of overwork, but he knew many who died of worry. Listen to me, worry is destructive. Listen to me, if some of you don't get a hold of this thing called worry and get victory over it, it's going to take you to the grave. Some of you tonight, I'm talking about people sitting in this room right now. You, because of your worry and anxiety, because you can't get victory over it, you've got ulcers right now, you've got migraines, you're tossing and turning at night. And you, you, some of you, your hair's turning gray. Some of you, your hair's turning loose. Come on now. I mean, there's some physical side effects to this thing called worry. See, some of you, you don't just worry about your finances and your kids and your family. You don't just worry about the situations you are facing. Many of you... You worry about situations that you may face or could face one day that hadn't even happened yet. You say, well, 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 what if that doctor calls back and he says the C word? What happens to me when I get down to the end and I'm on my deathbed? What happens when I lose my spouse? God forbid whatever happens if something that happens to my children. And all of a sudden, those big what-ifs of life, boy, they can eat away at us, can't they? Yeah, yeah. But the day my wife and I were talking, and it was one of those talks that you have to have, and you don't want to have it, but you have to have it. What if something happens to her? What if something happens to me? Now, we got life insurance. We got all that taken care of. But then the conversation began to evolve, and it finally got to the place where we had to ask the question, what about our little girl? All of a sudden, it got real heavy. All of a sudden, we had to call a timeout. I'm talking about the what is. Can I help you tonight? I'm not your pastor. 
can I pass you a little bit tonight? If and when you get to that place in your life, listen to me, God has grace for the hour that you get. Yeah. How many ever seen somebody stand up here in the front of the church and the casket's here and the loved one's there? And boy, maybe they did lose a spouse. Or maybe they did lose a loved one or a child. And you walk past them and you think to yourself, how are they holding it together? How do they seem so strong? And maybe you ask them about it afterwards. Listen to me. They would say, I, I don't know. It's beyond my understanding. Yeah. But there's a peace in my heart. God will give you grace in the hour that you need it. So for you to sit around and worry about the big what is of life, you're experiencing the pain of those situations without the, the grace that God has for you in those situations because you're not there yet. Mark it down. God will have grace for you in that hour that you need. It. The first reason we ought not worry tonight, biblical reason, I believe, is because it's, it is destructive to our lives physically. But notice number two tonight, the second biblical reason we ought not worry tonight is because worry is not only a destructive, but worry is also disobedient. If you're going to study the Word of God, you'll find there's two uh, primary passages that deal with the subject of worry. One of them is Philippians chapter 4. The other is Matthew chapter 6. Philippians 4 tells us why, uh, how not to worry. Matthew chapter 6 tells us why not to worry. In Philippians chapter 6, three times in that passage, Jesus says, take no thought, take no thought, uh, take no thought. In other words, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Friend, not only in those two passages, but all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament, God says over and over again, don't worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. You say, well, Brother Taylor, I mean, I know what God's Word says, but if you knew my mom, I mean, if you knew my mama, I mean, she was a worrier. I mean, from sun up to sundown, she was a, she worried about everything. And Brother Taylor, I mean, I just think it's hereditary. I mean, my mama was a worrier. Now I'm a worrier. I worry about everything. I mean, it's just, it's just, it runs in our family. It's just a weakness. No, listen to me very closely. Worry is not weakness. Worry is wickedness. Worry is a sin. God says, do not worry. And you continue to worry. You're disobeying the Lord Jesus Christ. When you worry, you're saying, God, I don't, I don't think you're big enough to handle that. Lord, I don't think you care about me. Lord, I don't think that you love me. What worry is offensive to God? I think it hurts his heart. He looks down there and looks at us and thinks, what are you worrying about? Number one, when you feel, I heard somebody say, I read this this week somewhere, it says anxiety is an alert signaling you to pray. Mm -hmm. Friend, when you will see, when you begin to sense, and how about you, but I can sense it coming on, can't you? All of a sudden it begins to fill my heart. I, you get worried about your finances or this family situation or this drama taking place, or this situation at work, or this health uh, situation. And all of a sudden those things begin to fill your heart. First step, stop. Cease. Notice number two tonight, I want you to see this, the second word. Not only does he say cease, number two, write this down. Write, word, write down the word come. Come. It's, uh, when you get to Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse number 6, he goes on to say, Be careful for nothing but in everything uh, by prayer. Uh, Paul commands the Philippians not to worry, but he does not stop there. He proceeds to instruct them on how to win the battle against worry. The answer for anxiety and the cure for worry is prayer. But Paul doesn't just say, uh, uh, what he's, he's saying, uh, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. But look at tonight, he didn't just say, they pray about it. He's too wise for that. He goes on to give three specific words to describe the kind of praying that is required to defeat worry in our hearts and life. And here in verse number 6 and 7, Paul invites us believers, you and I and those believers in Philippi, into the very presence 
of God. He says, come. Notice these three words that he gives us about prayer here in verse number six. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He says, first of all, when you begin to worry, come into the presence of God and pray. And the word prayer here in verse number six carries the idea of adoration and devotion. We would say the word worship. Can I say tonight, whenever you find yourself uh, overwhelmed with worry and fears and anxiety, our first action should be to get along and worship God. In other words, I find myself, when I get into the presence of God, and God gets big and my problems get small. And here's what God is, uh, what the Bible is saying tonight. Uh, Paul is saying, uh, when you get overwhelmed and you start to worry and your heart is, is filled with anxiety, stop dwelling on your problems and start dwelling in in his presence. Yeah. I've had in my life that I can worry real good and I can worship real good, but I can't do both at the same time. Yeah. But boy, when I get into his presence and I'm overwhelmed with whatever problem I'm worried with, when I get into his presence and I begin to spend some time worshiping God for who he is, well, all of a sudden the things that I worry about begin to shrink down. In the early days of aviation, a man was attempting to fly around the world. He took off and he was in the air for some time and he got out over the, over the water and he began to hear some, what we thought was some gnawing in the back of that plane. Finally, he realized the rat had stuck onto that plane and was beginning to gnaw on the cables and wires inside of that plane. All of a sudden, his heart started to race, his sweat started to run down his forehead. He thought, what in the world am I going to do? I mean, it's several hours back, I guess several more hours to go. I mean, I'm over the water, what am I going to do? All of a sudden he realized that that thing was a rodent and the rodents were not built for the altitude. And so he took that plane up about a thousand feet, another thousand feet, another thousand feet. And finally he listened back and he didn't hear that rat any longer. He kept on flying to his destination, finally landed that plane. He went to the back, began to inspect the back of that plane. And sure enough, there was that dead rat that had snuck in under that man's plane. Can I say this tonight? Your worry is a lot like that rat. Your, as the rat can not survive the altitude. Your, wor your worries cannot survive in the secret place of the Most High. The worship is a worry killer. Well, when you get into the presence of God and you say, God, there's no God like you. God, you're the God who created the world and you're bigger than any problem that I have. You love me and you care for me. You've always provided for me. There's nothing too hard for you. And you get into the presence of God and worship the King of Kings. Boy, God gets big and your problems get small. The first step to overcoming your worries tonight is to enter into the presence of God praying and worshiping Him. Notice the second word tonight. He invites us into the presence of God, not just praying, but He says, come to the presence of God tonight, pleading. He says, pleading. It goes on to say in verse number 6, by prayer and supplication. That word supplication means to plead. It's an earnest sharing of our needs and our problems. In other words, this is not half-hearted prayer. This is not casual prayer. This is not flippant prayer. Uh, this is uh, this is wholehearted, serious prayer. In fact, I'm not sure... You'll ever find an, uh, uh, an illustration or a picture of half-hearted prayer in the, the Word of God. This is sincere praying with spiritual intensity. And so whatever it is that's keeping you up at night, that's causing you to toss and turn at night, if it's a situation with your kids, then pray for your kids. If you're worried about your marriage tonight, then pray for your marriage tonight. If you're worried about your finances tonight, then plead with God about your finances tonight. He says, come into the presence of God praying. And he says, come into the presence of God, pleading. Can I say tonight, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. G. Campbell Morgan, the old expository preacher, uh, once gave a compelling sermon about how believers are to be, uh, bring every request before God. After the service, an elderly woman walked up to him and asked Dr. Morgan, should I really bring every request to God? Doesn't he have so much more to be concerned about than my little request? G. Campbell Morgan looked at that lady with a gleam in his eye and said, Madam, can you conceive of anything that's not small to God? We come pleading. 
Notice the third word tonight. Come before his presence praying. Come into his presence pleading. And he says the thirdly here, come into his presence praising. Notice he goes on to say in verse number six, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He says, come to God with thanksgiving. You know one of the greatest things that you and I can do during a time of worry, a time of distress, during a time of anxiety, is just to stop and have a praise service. Amen. It's time to just stop and have a testimony service and be reminded and remind God and remind yourself of all the times that he's provided for you and that he's loved you and that he's come through for you and that he's delivered you. Hey, it's good to have a Thanksgiving service to overcome the worry. I start to think about uh, thinking for all the times that he's come through for us and that he's opened doors and that he's delivered and that he's provided for us in the past and that gives me confidence that he's going to do it again in the future. Number one, come tonight. Number two, he, number one, he says cease. Number two, he says come. But notice that last phrase in verse number six. He says, let your request be made known unto God. It doesn't say let your request be made known unto them. It says let your request be made known unto him. Listen, nothing wrong with sharing prayer with us. You know that. Nothing wrong with saying, Pastor, will you pray with me about this? Nothing wrong with that. And I say this, God says, let your request be made known unto me. You know why people complain and put their drama all over Facebook? You know why some of you do that? Because you don't have a prayer life. If you had a prayer life, you wouldn't put all that garbage on Facebook. And if you repeatedly put that on there anyway, you're hidden from most of your friends anyway. Because they're tired of hearing about it. Let your request be made known unto him. The Bible says, cast thy burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. The Bible says, casting all you care upon him, for he careth for you. The Bible says in Psalms, I love this verse, it says, pour your heart out before him. Isn't that a great picture? I don't know that my heart so easily gets filled with this concern and that concern and the wood up of here. And boy, before I know it, it's got me weighed down. It's got me distracted. It's got me overwhelmed and discouraged and fearful. And God says, take all of those things that clutter your heart and pour them out. Well, that's a good place to be, isn't it? Number one, he says, cease. Number two, he says, come. And lastly, number three, he write this word down. It's calm. It's the word calm. Notice verse number seven. The Bible says, in the peace of God. Now, verse number seven, now verse number six, that last phrase, he said, let your request be made known unto God. Whatever you're worried about, let it be known unto God. Then verse number seven, look here very carefully. It says, and God shall fulfill all of your requests. Not what mine says. You better get a hold of this in your Christian life. If you don't get a hold of what I'm about to say, you're going to have a hard time. If I don't get a hold of it in my life, I'm going to have a hard time. God never promised to fulfill every request you bring before him. Well, if God would just fix this situation and provide for this bill and fix this family member and fix this issue at work then I wouldn't be worried anymore. God didn't promise that. But notice what he did promise in verse number 7. He says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God never promised to, to fulfill all of your requests, but he did promise that he would give you his peace. In other words, God doesn't always calm the storm but he always calms the serpents. J. Vernon McGee, how many knows that old preacher? You remember hearing him on the radio? He said, every once in a while, I'll still catch you on there. He said it this way. He said, notice that we enter this passage in a, we're speaking of verse 6 and 7. He says, notice we enter this passage in anxiety with worry, and we came out of the passage with peace. Between the two was prayer. In other words, the bridge between worry and peace is called prayer. 
In other words, tonight, you may be sitting here and you think, uh, Brother, well, let me, let me say it this way. If you were to go, don't turn there, but if you were to go to Daniel chapter 6 tonight, there's a wonderful illustration of this. You know the story of the writing side that nobody could pray for 30 days. Remember that story? And Daniel went, goes up to the chamber, opens up the window, and he kneels, and he, and he prays as he did aforetime. Well, the, the law was that if you prayed, you were thrown into the den of lions. But the Bible says right after that, verse number 10, that when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went unto his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber uh, toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying, there's that word, and making supplication, there's that word again, before his God. You know the rest of the story. They took Daniel, threw him into the den of lions. Now listen, I, I can't stand for sure, but I, I, would, I would dare to guess that Daniel had a peaceful night's sleep there in that day. But notice what it says about the king uh, who threw him into the den of lions. The Bible says in verse number 18, then the king went to his palace, excuse me, his plush, comfortable palace, and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Well, you can't replace the peace of God. Listen, you can go to the drugstore tonight, you can, buy, you can buy sleep, but you can't buy rest. There's two types of people here tonight. Some of you right now are in the midst of just a, just a difficult situation. There's turmoil in your life. It may be finances. It may be work. It may be your health. It may be in your family. But you're facing a difficult situation tonight. And right now you're worried sick. You can't get to sleep at night. You're popping pills just to get through the day. You're tossing and turning at night. You are absolutely miserable. And God says, you don't have to live that way. There's a better way. And he stands over here, and he invites you to enter into his presence, and he will take your worries, and he will give you his peace. Now, others of you tonight, you're in the midst of a storm of your life, and you've got problems, and you've got issues, and you've got uh, difficulties in your life, and your entire life may be falling down around you, but in the midst of that storm, you can't explain it. But tonight, you have the peace of God in your heart. If you're here tonight, if that's you, listen to me, there's only one way that you got here. You got here through prayer. I'm telling you, the peace of God is real. Can I say tonight as I close out, I love the old song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. The first verse says, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. If you're not experiencing the peace of God tonight, it's not His fault. That's right. He wants you to have it. And you can have it. But you're going to have to walk that bridge. Tonight, may I say as I close, there is a world of difference between the peace of God and having peace with God. The Bible speaks of both. And can I say tonight, you'll never have the peace of God until, first of all, you have peace with God. I love as Paul would write the different individuals and the churches. He'd always begin his greetings the same, wouldn't he? He would always say, grace and peace. There's a divine order there. You'll never find peace coming before grace. It's always grace followed by peace. Grace is salvation. And you'll never experience the peace with God, the peace of God, until first you have the grace of God. The old song says it this way. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Some of you tonight, the greatest fear that you have in your heart, you may not tell anybody, but deep down on the inside, your greatest worry and the greatest fear is where you're going to go when you die. You want to die one day. You want to die one day. I don't care if you're 8 years old or if you're 80 years old, you're going to die one day. And you're going to spend eternity somewhere forever. Deep down in your heart, you can say whatever you want to, but deep down in your heart, you know this ain't it. This ain't it. You may live 75, 80, 90 years if you're lucky, but this ain't the end. 
you know there's a world on the other side. And my question is tonight, are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tonight, if you're here and lost without Jesus Christ, you can get saved tonight. You can come to Jesus tonight. You can receive the gift of salvation tonight and have your sins forgiven. And you can walk out of here and making peace with God so that you can have the peace of God and you don't have to ever fear dying again. Amen. You can know and have the joy and the peace that one day when, uh, when you are called home, you'll spend all of eternity in a place called heaven. Well, there's no greater peace than that. There's no greater peace than that. And tonight, either you have it or you don't. And if you don't have it tonight, then during the invitation, I'm going to invite you to stand up. I'm going to invite you to step out of your pew. Say, excuse me if you have to. And I'm going to ask you to walk right down this aisle like an old-fashioned invitation. Is that okay tonight? And if you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat, walk right down this aisle, and let us take a Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You can be saved by faith tonight. Father, thank you that the peace of God, your peace, Lord, is beyond explanation. It's beyond understanding. Lord, even in the midst of the storm of our lives, Lord, we can experience your peace in our hearts. Lord, we don't have to toss and turn. We don't have to go through life miserable and a nervous wreck all the time. Lord, the fact of the matter is, too many of us tonight, we are too stressed to be blessed. And Lord, it is nobody else's fault but our own. Lord, we need to cease. We need to come so that we can experience the calming peace of God. If you're here tonight, you say, Brother Taylor, my heart and mind has been filled with worry. There's some situations that I've been wrestling with that I've been trying to figure out, trying to work out. I've been so nervous about it. My stomach's been in knots. And tonight God spoke to my heart. And I need to give those situations to Him. How many says tonight, that's me, Brother Taylor. Are there some issues? There's some situations? There's some circumstances in my life? I need to give to God tonight. I need to give to God tonight. I'm tired of being burdened by them. I'm tired of worrying about them. I'm tired of being anxious about it tonight. I need to give it to God. Give it to Him. How many here tonight would say, Brother Taylor, I, I am not troubled at the thought of dying because I know that when I die, I have peace with God. Because I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I know that my sins are forgiven. I know that because of what Jesus did on the cross for me, and my, I place my faith in Him alone, I know I have peace with God tonight. I'm not troubled about the thought of dying. If that's you, would you raise your hand tonight? Hands all over this place. Lord bless you. How many sins, Brother Taylor? Ooh, I wanted to raise my hand. But if I had to be honest tonight, I could. Because the thought of dying troubles me. Tonight, preacher, I'm concerned for my soul. Tonight, I'm concerned about where I'll spend eternity. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to hell. And if truth be told, it keeps me up at night. And as much as I try to push it aside, as much as I try to block it out, it continues to trouble me. Preacher, would you pray for me? I want to have the peace of knowing that when I die one day, that I will go to heaven. If that's you tonight, would you please raise your hand and say, pray for me. I want that peace. I see that hand back there. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I want that peace tonight. I want that peace tonight. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. Pray for me, preacher. Anyone like that at all? I didn't raise it the first time. I'll raise it the second time. Preacher, I don't have that peace, but I want that peace. Lord, you see the hands and the hearts tonight. Lord, please help us to respond and do whatever you told us to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's